Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Qinghua Chuang, and this is my pleasure to be here to introduce myself and my research to you. So the presentation title is Human-Centered Computing in Communication, an Interdisciplinary Approach. So uh, I would say uh, my academic journey is anything but typical. So uh, I'm currently a assistant professor in uh, interactive media in School of uh, uh, Communication. And um, I, but I'm a computer scientist. Uh, and before that, I was in electrical engineering. So uh, I'm always fascinated about what we do in computing, and particularly in artificial intelligence. And my research focuses on human-centered computing. And over the years since I joined uh, Interactive Media, uh, I become more aware about um, the social change and social good, and I want to uh, emphasize. Uh, I want to focus on AI for social good. So I'm doing a lot of projects with uh, communication faculties on um, projects that aim for social change. So uh, my journey uh, started in the field called music information retrieval. Uh, I was very fortunate uh, that I can combine my professional skills, uh, which is in the computing side, uh, with my passion, which is music, uh, to create computer software that can analyze music to generate music. Um, before I came to the US uh, for my PhD study, I was a guitarist in rock bands. So, <laughs> so I play gigs with my band members in various events, and uh, I enjoy that a lot. Uh, but after I came to the US, um, I don't have a big mic band member anymore. So uh, that actually inspired me to create a computer system that can generate music in a particular style, and which became my uh, dissertation. So um, uh, throughout the year, my, well, my research started uh, with my passion, which is music, and I feel that by doing those uh, projects, I reach out to a lot of musicians and people who love music. Um, but I want to do, I want to reach out more people. So uh, I started another direction, uh, which is uh, the gesture recognition for American Sign Language. And this is actually, this project became a, a turning point of my career. Um, so in the beginning, uh, just like everybody uh, here we, we, uh, we do, um, I was trying to improve the accuracy of the recognition. Uh, so we use uh, computer vision technique, we use uh, 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 the data from the sensors and so on. Um, but after that, uh, I had a collaborator who is in deaf education, and through her, uh, I get to touch uh, with people in the deaf community. And uh, the more I talked to them, the more I found out that's not what they need. So uh, more than 90% of the uh, children who are uh, deaf or hard of hearing, they were born to uh, hearing parents. So they don't have a natural way to communicate with each other. And in that scenario, they don't need a translator. What they want to do is they want more people that understand uh, the language so that they can communicate and the language is part of their culture. So uh, after that, uh, that I uh, kind of uh, switched the direction of project. So we created a, a video game uh, to help children learn American Sign Language. And we use AI as a component in the game to recognize whether or not they uh, perform the uh, gesture correctly. So um, after I joined um, uh, Interactive Media, um, my focus uh, becomes finding AI solutions to understand what people need and how computing can help. So uh, this is one of the projects that I collaborate with uh, Dr. Susan Morgan, uh, who is an um, expert in health communication for clinical trials. So uh, together, we created a, a chatbot for patients and their family members uh, that help them to proactively check their eligibilities for a particular clinical trial. And uh, another project uh, that I work with other faculty in communication and a PhD student is this one. It's also a chatbot in health communication, but this one is for Colin Health. So um, the focus in this project is that we want to know 
how chatbot can facilitate a medical interview that consists of embarrassing questions, like something about diarrhea. Well, sorry, I know you just had a lunch. <laughs> so, so we want to know, like compared with uh, uh, human physicians, will people feel more comfortable talking to a chatbot about these uh, embarrassing uh, issues? And how chatbot can encourage people um, to share uh, more their personal experience or concerns? So uh, to, do, uh, to answer these questions, uh, we created a, a chatbot on the website. We conducted it online experiments. And um, so we collect the data. And after that, uh, I used the large language models to analyze the conversation between the patient and the chatbot. Okay. So... Um, here just some examples of the, the project I do. So the next one is an ongoing uh, project, and this is related to explainable AI. So uh, explainable AI is a quite important and active field in computer science, uh, in, in uh, computer science and in artificial intelligence uh, for uh, the AI transparency, accountability, responsibility, and. Um, in the AI systems, uh, there are a lot of different types of stakeholders. So for example, the developers, uh, decision makers, and end user, and so on. So uh, currently, most of the explainable AI uh, work, they focus on developers and decision makers, and uh, also the end users, so the users who use AI as a tool to help them complete a task. So for this study, uh, we want to focus on a different type of users. Uh, they are called the imposed users. So who are they? So essentially, they are required to use AI, but they don't use that for, uh, to, to complete a task. But the outcome of AI will affect these people. So for example, think about a recommendation system. Right, so uh, through the AI algorithm, they got some recommendations. So uh, the, uh, the, uh, the outcome of the system will impact them. So, uh, so in this study, what we want to know is uh, for the state of the art uh, explainable AI formats, which ones that's more, most effective for impulse user to understand why they got a particular uh, decision from the system or recommendation from the system. And the research question too is that we think we want to well, we want to explore the um, uh, potential of using explanations to increase people's awareness of algorithmic bias. So uh, we conduct experiment and to uh, to make the uh, in experiment uh, in a realistic situation, like for impulse users. Um, I create this website and uh, I use the webcams uh, that capture the participant's image and use AI algorithm to analyze their face and recommend a skin product uh, for them. Yeah, so they become the impulse user. And uh, so, and then we study how that uh, affect their uh, attitude towards the, the AI. Will the explanation help them understand why they got this recommendation and so on. And based on the result that we found that the, uh, particularly the explanation by examples, this helps the participants be more aware of algorithmic bias. Okay. So uh, one more project. So this is about uh, XR, Extended Reality Smart Assistance. And uh, well, some, some you will hear people call it uh, augmented reality or mixed reality. Uh, and uh, here I just call it uh, XR, the Extended Reality. So uh, for these type of headsets like HoloLens, Magic Leap, uh, in which you can see the physical environment uh, as well as some virtual contents, uh, you, uh, there is a particular type of application that's very popular in the industry, which is the training app. So essentially, the user of uh, the apps, they will follow the instruction that's showing uh, on the screen and com to complete a task. So however, most of these uh, uh, training apps, uh, they don't have AI as a component in the app. So what it means is that 
this kind of apps, they only use the headset as an interactive digital manual. So you can see all the steps, you can see all the pages. However, whether or not you actually follow the step, you're actually doing things right, <laughs> that's up to you. So, uh, so this project uh, is about adding AI to uh, these kind of XR training uh, apps. So essentially, uh, we used uh, we trained the uh, the machine learning uh, the object uh, detection um, uh, model that can recognize the the users uh, whether or not they're following the steps and uh, if they uh, make the mistake or uh, they skip a step, uh, we will alert the user. And uh, so this project. Um, we have a lot of uh, students in interactive media that are involved in this project, and we also get help from the uh, folks in uh, XR uh, Lab. So we have a poster over there, so please do check it out, and we also have a demo there, so you can really play with the app. Yes. So that's all the example that I want to share with you. So uh, let's keep in touch, and let's have a conversation during the break. Thank you. Thank you, Chinwa. Uh, any uh, quick one time for a quick question? Uh, Nick? Fascinating, Chinhua. So um, in the experiment that you did then where you actually um, per, um, basically recommend a, a skin product, so how many people you, you ask and what some of the interesting um, you know, lessons that you learned there? Yeah, so uh, I think the most interesting thing is that uh, in, uh, the, in the technical sense, um, uh, we can build a model for anyone, in, for people in any ages, and uh, identify uh, their uh, age, uh, their uh, gender, and so on. And, and if you want to optimize this process, you can find so-called the best product for each condition. But in social science, however, uh, we, have to, um, ver uh, we have to prove the theory using the experiment data. So if we try to optimize that for every single individual, that won't be an experiment. So the experiments can only have several conditions. You want to control most of the, the variables. So, uh, so I had a, um, I have to make uh, adjustments, so try to stay true with the, uh, the AI model. So uh, I divide the people into s uh, three different age groups. And for each group, I choose the most common features, uh, patterns, and for one product for each group. Yeah. Thank you for something. Yeah, um, so with that same example, did you train it completely from data, or did you uh, use some dermatologists or other skin experts to help kind of guide the yeah, so I completely trend from the data. There's a, a public available data set for uh, age. Yeah, so I use that to train the models to basically, it's not directly related to, to the skin product, but more about guessing the age of that person. So the recommended products, and then we just, uh, that came from us. We made the decision. So that we only have like three different types of uh, products. We try, well, the, actually there's only one type of product, but the exponential has three different types be, based on the age group. Yeah. But the recommendation? The recommendation has to be the same. So that the, the only thing that changes is the, the explanation. Yeah. Okay, thank you.